Do we have our, a thank you? Okay, so good morning and welcome back to the second day of our conference and, and now you can um, hear me. So yesterday we had a very full day on um, our conversations around implementing the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and much of the conversation was about legal rights and legal issues. Um, today's plenary session is um, a special session inspired by um, the UN designating this the International Year of Indigenous Languages. And in some ways, I think, and the panelists will elaborate on this, that language is one of the most fundamental aspects of human identity generally, um, but certainly of the indigenous struggle for self-determination and survival um, in this very um, complicated and contested and challenging world we live in. A lot of the meaning, the um, ways of understanding the world and ways of adapting to the future um, are embedded deeply in indigenous languages, um, which hold so much meaning. But at the same time, they've been um, very much challenged over the years and even overtly suppressed um, by many state governments. And so um, inspired by the International Year of Indigenous Languages, um, we decided to have a, a special session um, in the spirit of implementing the declaration. And we have, I, I will let um, Dr. Andy Cowell introduce the panelists, um, but we have an amazing crew here um, and they'll be speaking um, in English, but also in Arapaho, Karelian, and Cherokee. You'll probably hear um, bits of each one. So um, with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Andy Cowell. Thank you. Hey, well, hey. Is, okay. This this is not working. Okay. Um woke he. Um he won ha nuhuna beat a wuna nuhu hitasina na hinona eina na watana hithi um na tata na he won ha ha. Well hey, hat ni nona e to sina uh hinona e ni uh ni ni na ha fe na nuhu ni ha fo yeti uh huti na uh Chi Haina Wunak Nuh uh Hanatit. So he won ha ha Hatna Natini hi nuh so what the nitta nini uh Hanatitana uh Nanes na hani hita no nuh hanatitana uh nuh wahani tan uh na sini hithi nuh chach nuh chachwan uh thwat the nitta nini hanatitana well, hey, hatni hand at dinner, he won ha 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 tini. So, ni bet bis in hina, uh, chasse hanathe no, uh, nuhu, nuhu, thwathanita, hanatitina, uh, hatha alanita, no, uh, he ha bat had to nanana, need the nuno, nuhu, nuhu, hinona e nona teed. Ah, no, 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 um ah nuhu nuhu what on it and uh nuhu uh nuhu um what honey senate heat um uh ni ni always the well had to uh to know what i knew who he not ate it no no who thought in it any uh hand it did not so um Hat and Nitana, Ninana Hithi, Hatti, Checker Hays, and O Hatti, the no, no, Hatti, he fit on eat easy. Now Hatti, Javena Woon, Arthi, Hatti, and even a no, Nianay Starthi, Hitana Deed on in a, Hitta sit on in a, Nanay Sister Charthi, Neath a son of Hathi, now Nianay, a son of Hathi, Dashka. So, um, uh, ah, um, 
نقاثيني نهو ثواتن التانيني هانتيتنا هاوناتي هيهينا نهو هاخوتنا آه ناتي هيهينا نهو هاخوتنا آه ننتنا هيهاوني تنو نو نهو هانتيتنا so I will, I will quickly introduce the, uh, the speakers. Um, so first of all, we will have Alexi uh, Sikarev, who is um, on the UN panel um, for the 2019 Year of the Indigenous Languages. He is a, an activist in um, Russia and specifically in Karelia, related to the Karelian minority language spoken um, on, on Russian Finnish border. Um, he's a member of the Executive Mechanism for the Rights of Indigenous People of the UN. Um, we will also have um, standing in for um, one of our speakers will be Clint Carroll, who's a faculty member here at CU um, and has uh, worked with the Cherokee community in Oklahoma, um, especially on ethnobotany um, and traditional knowledge. And then we will also have John um, Bullet Standing Deer, who is also a Cherokee, um, who's a language activist from North Carolina, um, who is, has learned uh, Cherokee as a second language and developed and now patented um, a particular new method for learning and acquiring the language effectively um, and continues to be strongly involved in the local community um, with, with language um, revitalization. So we'll start with Alexi. Tervehti teille, hyvät rahvas, suuret passivot kutsusta. Meillä on ilo ja kunniva olla täällä ja toivotan menestyssä onnia ja lykkyä. Good morning, my name is Alexei Tsikarev again and I just said a couple of words in, in my own language, the Karelian language, which is spoken in in the Republic of Karelia mostly, but also in the Tverskaya Oblast, which is close to Moscow, uh, where Karelians also historically settle, uh, and uh, some Karelians live in, in Finland. Uh, so uh, totally in, in the Russian Federation currently, Karelians are 65,000 people, uh, and some 5,000 people probably in Finland, but it's, it's not, uh, uh, there is no, uh, uh, exact data on how many Karelians live uh, in, in Finland. So um, I, I will try in, in my presentation to, uh, to be in two capacities. Uh, in my capacity as expert member of the UX, UN expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous peoples and also in my capacity as, as a Karelian and a uh, language activist in, in the Republic of Karelia. So I will try to uh, to bring an overall uh, an overview on, on the uh, uh, International Year of Indigenous Languages, its purposes, uh, the backgrounds, and also we'll try to, to show some, showcase some examples of uh, language activism in, in Karelia and Russia and beyond. Uh, and uh, in, in the end of the presentation, we'll focus on the uh, possible developments uh, where this language here could lead to. So, um, uh, first of all, I would like to say that um, uh, the indigenous languages are very endangered. Uh, UNESCO claims that uh, there are 2,680 indigenous languages in danger out of 7,000 languages spoken in indigenous communities. Um, the former Secretary General of the United Nations, Pan Ki-moon, also said that uh, every second week, one indigenous language dies. Uh, in 2016, the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues uh, convened uh, an expert group meeting on the preservation and uh, uh, revitalization of indigenous languages, where we uh, outlined some of the concerns, and uh, the outcome document of that expert group meeting was a trigger uh, for the UN General Assembly to uh, take action on the International Year of Indigenous Languages as a first step uh, to uh, 
for, to, towards the better recognition and towards a better understanding of the critical loss of indigenous languages and potential measures with, which could lead to the uh, uh, in, to enhancing of this uh, critical situation. I recently attended a meeting uh, on indigenous languages in the Russian uh, island of Sakhalin, which is in the Russian Far East, close to Japan. Um, Sakhalin is, uh, is a homeland for five uh, indigenous peoples right now, and uh, this, all of these languages, like Nif language or uh, Wilta uh, language, they're very endangered. Uh, 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 the communities who speak these languages uh, uh, are very small numbered. Uh, it's like from tens of people to uh, hundreds. And um, some of the researchers who spoke at the conference uh, were very concerned about the uh, critical situation. And they also expressed an opinion that these indigenous languages uh, can probably be spoken only as, a pro pro as professional languages, for example, in reindeer communities, because uh, for reindeer, uh, communities, it's very important to, uh, to possess the uh, vocabulary uh, which belongs to, to this particular profession um, and occupation, traditional occupation of indigenous peoples. Uh, and they expressed an opinion that um, indigenous languages could serve as, for example, Latin language serves for medicine and biology and, and the science. Uh, and of course, there were other opinions, other researchers who uh, uh, disagreed with this, this position and thought that uh, indigenous languages uh, should be, um, should be uh, preserved uh, for, uh, for greater, uh, I mean, um, for indigenous peoples to be able to speak these languages in, in many other areas too. Uh, in, in Karelia, we also speak sometimes about uh, so-called um, genetically native language. And it is very sad because, um, I mean, I, I would tell also a story that a couple of years ago I attended another meeting where um, uh, an ombudsman, a human rights ombudsman from a, uh, a southern republic in Russia, where indigenous languages are still spoken very well, and uh, he, he was heard about uh, a language day, which we sometimes uh, hold, like the, there is a UN language day, it's the 20, 21st of February, but uh, in Karelia we have also uh, the day for the Karelian uh, language and Websian language, which are the uh, indigenous languages of the Republic. And he was very, he was one, wondering why we should have like just one day a year uh, uh, when we speak this language. Every year, every day should be uh, a language day. And, um, uh, come, uh, going forward, um, I would also like to mention that um, uh, languages, indigenous languages, are, are very much linked to the biological diversity. So biological diversity and linguistic diversity are very um, uh, linked to each other, and researchers even claim that um, biodiversity hotspots and high uh, biodiversity wilderness, er, wilderness areas and are home also to about 70% of the world's languages. And of course, all these languages are linked very much to the uh, traditional knowledge and uh, understanding of, uh, by indigenous peoples about the nature, uh, natural resources, and so on. So this is why indigenous languages are very, um, uh, very important. And this is why the UN General Assembly unanimously, uh, by consensus, uh, adopted the resolution to proclaim the International Year of Indigenous Languages. So the key areas identified by UNESCO, which is the lead agency to uh, prepare and uh, undertake measures uh, under this year. Uh, so the key areas are increasing understanding, uh, reconciliation and international cooperation in the sphere of indigenous languages, creation of favorable conditions for knowledge sharing and dissemination good practices, uh, integration of indigenous languages in the standard setting, improvement through capacity building of communities, and growth and development through elaboration of new knowledge. Uh, we also think uh, in the United Nations, and especially in the expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous peoples, that uh, language is a human right. Uh, there are many approaches how indigenous languages are um, are being approached right now. It's, uh, first of all, a cultural approach. For example, if we take 
if you have a look at the a UNESCO policy on, uh, uh, of engaging with indigenous peoples, uh, there is a, a sentence there that indigenous languages are part of the uh, cultural heritage, uh, intangible cultural heritage, heritage first of all. Uh, and this is true partly, but of course uh, indigenous languages are much more than, than only uh, a part of the cultural heritage. And um, uh, I would like to advertise that um, uh, together with uh, Professor Car Carpenter, we right now are working on an article, uh, Language as a Human Right. And um, this is a, an attempt to theoretically approach this issue uh, and uh, propose some ideas on how to improve policies nationally, internationally, locally uh, to support indigenous languages. Um, there are many stories about um, injustices which link to, uh, to the lack of um, support and taxes for indigenous languages across the world. And one of the examples from my, uh, from my country is a couple of years ago, uh, we had a trial uh, in the St. Petersburg court when a, a, a person from Tuvar Republic, uh, who is a native uh, Tuvar indigenous person, uh, was refused to, um, to receive interpretation in the court to, to his language. Uh, and the, the, the judge actually said that um, there is no need for such interpretation because uh, all, Rus all people who live in Russia must know Russian language. And secondly, there is no such people and such republic in, in the Russian Federation as Tvar Republic, which was very actually sad and uh, strange for a judge uh, uh, to, to know, to, to don't even uh, understand the Russian geography, uh, but also more broadly uh, uh, Russian ethnology and, uh, and human rights. Uh, internationally, of course, there are uh, some international standards on, on the indigenous people's rights. First of all, I would like to refer to the, uh, uh, to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which for us is the main topic uh, during this conference. And Article 13 says that indigenous peoples have the right to revitalize, use, develop, and transmit to future generations their histories, languages, and traditions. Uh, the expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous peoples over the last 20, uh, 12 years has undertaken uh, several studies which focus on uh, languages and cultural rights, and uh, these studies are studies, uh, study on education, uh, study on languages and cultures, and their roles in the, in the promotion and protection of the rights of indigenous peoples, and the most recent study on, on the cultural heritage. And in these studies, uh, the, expert mechanisms, uh, the expert mechanism proposes some recommendations for states, including uh, to promote all indigenous languages and provide uh, sufficient funding. Uh, and we also claim in the study that th this funding should be at least uh, the same level uh, of money which has been spent to destroy indigenous linguistic systems over the centuries. Uh, and of course, we also uh, suggest that states obtain indigenous uh, people's free, prior and informed consent uh, while proposing policies. This is very important, uh, given many examples across the world how indigenous people's FPIC uh, is not being obtained. In, in my particular republic, uh, 10 years ago, the government uh, adopted so-called strategy uh, for uh, development of the Karelian language, which said that uh, Karelian language should be, for the Karelian language should be uh, introduced a unified Karelian language out of the three major dialects. But the Karelians themselves were not actually asked for uh, permission to create such a language, and they don't even want to do so because uh, they think that these three dialects which are spoken now, so the, this is the richness of, 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 this, uh, of this culture, and we should preserve the three, uh, uh, all of the three uh, uh, dialects. And for the... Um, uh, while, while doing this, uh, this article right now, so we, we think that uh, these international standards are not enough right now to support fully uh, indigenous languages and um, uh, this, uh, uh, this, this uh, documents, um, I mean, uh, which state have uh, approved, in, including the declaration, but also uh, other documents. So they're not enough because they're not binding for states mostly and uh, uh, they are not universal. 
Uh, I should also say that um, for the for going forward uh, in terms of development of indigenous languages, there should be in the first place uh, full recognition of historical injustices, uh, full understanding what what, ha what had happened, and uh, only this recognition uh, can lead to uh, to the mutual uh, understanding and joint work by indigenous communities and states and the international community towards uh, uh, improved measures on indigenous languages. Uh, and of course, the, the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in, in Canada and other examples across the world uh, are good examples uh, how it should be done. Um, while speaking about languages, uh, the, we, we also, we, we, um, first of all, uh, we, we speak about education. In, in Russia, for example, it's, uh, it's the case. Um, uh, and indigenous peoples, according to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, should have the right to control their educational systems, and they have the, the, the right to establish their educational systems. Uh, this, is, um, this is not the case in, in many indigenous areas. Uh, in Russia, we have uh, so-called uh, nomadic schools in, in the areas where reindeer herders exercise their uh, traditional occupations. And, and for reindeer herders, um, it's very important that indigenous, uh, that their kids uh, are with them all the time because uh, they say that, for example, if, if the kids uh, are in families, uh, so they, they could uh, even go and alone, uh, without parents, uh, hurt reindeers uh, since 12 years, since, since the age of 12. But if they are not, so if they are, for example, in the boarding school somewhere, so uh, they cannot even be um, allowed to uh, hurt reindeers uh, at the age of 14 or 16. And uh, from, from the education, uh, we should go forward to revitalization measures, and uh, in many indigenous linguistic communities where the languages are very much endangered, uh, we should speak about uh, uh, serious measures like languageness, for example, is very much known me methodology created by Maoris in New Zealand, but uh, this methodology has, uh, has gone to, to Hawaii, to Finland, uh, and from Finland to, to many Russian uh, indigenous communities, like in my republic, uh, there is one language nest at least, uh, where indigenous, la indigenous kids are uh, only spoken uh, to uh, uh, in Karenian language. Uh, indigenous peoples should also have the right to control the uh, uh, written, uh, the, the writing systems, and this is sometimes not the case. Um, uh, I, I should only, I should also refer to uh, to my uh, personal experience in advocating for the Karelian language status uh, in in my republic, which is the only republic in Russia where we have only one indigenous language, uh, only one official language, which is Russian. Other republics have both uh, Russian and an, an indigenous language, or even in some. Uh, uh, Southern republics, we have like 14 indigenous languages uh, spoken as official. Um, but uh, the gov this is one good example how uh, the government can also approach the language issue from the national security perspective, because in this case, the government thinks that Karelian language is a threat for the national security because it is a kindred language to the Finnish language. And the fin Finland, of course, is part of the Western society. and. Uh, uh, they have uh, some intentions to join NATO and uh, and the European Union, part of the European Union, and so on. So that's why Russia thinks that um, uh, if the Karelian language would base on uh, Latin alphabet and would be um, an official language of the Republic, so it's uh, pretty much threat for for the national security. And, uh, and there is a federal law which says that the uh, that. Uh, 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 indig that languages, official languages in republics of the, of the Russian Federation should be based only on Cyrillic uh, script uh, because all of these languages are part of the so-called Russian world. And uh, this, this contest, of course, uh, indigenous people's rights pretty much. Languages have uh, a crucial role for the access to uh, political, social, economic rights. A uh, good example from Finland, uh, 
in order for indigenous Samis to vote uh, in the elections for the Finnish Sami parliament, they should uh, uh, prove that they uh, uh, themselves or their parents or grandparents uh, have spoken uh, Sami language as the first language. Um, indigenous lang languages are also very important for the modern democracy, for election processes, uh, and uh, when we designed, uh, together with colleagues in UNESCO and other mechanisms, the International Year of Indigenous Languages, uh, we spoke about the need for support of grassroots level activists, because on their shoulders uh, many of efforts uh, uh, lay right now. And indeed, community-led uh, language activism uh, is very crucial uh, and should be supported during this year. We have in my republic such great initiatives like uh, Karelian Language House, uh, because sometimes we need a physical space for indigenous peoples to, to be able to exercise their linguistic rights, uh, because it, in some villages, these kind of houses are the only place where they can do it, uh, get together and uh, do something uh, in their languages. Uh, in one of the MRIP studies of, uh, on businesses, on indigenous businesses, we also claim that uh, indigenous businesses uh, uh, only in those cases are sustainable when they are based on indigenous languages and, and indigenous cultures. Uh, one of the priorities of the International Year is to support indigenous languages uh, uh, and, uh, uh, in, in, on the internet and using in, in, um, uh, new technologies to support the languages. So many indigenous communities right now focus on uh, go into the internet and uh, uh, improve, uh, I mean, uh, developing Wikipedia, uh, translating social media uh, interfaces in the languages. Also, uh, indigenous languages are very crucial for, uh, for the economic rights. Uh, we, have, um, uh, we have spoken a lot about the, uh, the need to, uh, to develop a social uh, impact assessment. Uh, when infrastructure projects uh, are being developed in many indigenous areas, but how to actually uh, measure uh, infrastructure projects' impact on indigenous languages and culture, this question is still pending and it's still unclear. Uh, together with other mechanisms, with the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues and with the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, we, we have um, signed a joint letter uh, and um, we support the idea of expanding the international year towards the international decade on indigenous languages because we think that it's not enough uh, just one year to, uh, to, to do this, this work. And uh, one of the members of the steering committee and one of the co-chairs of the steering committee, Grand Chief Ed John, uh, once said that um, the international year should be just an appetizer and then the, the, uh, the main dish is the decade which allows us to to do much more work. And uh, going to, to an end of uh, my, uh, my speech, I would like to, to mention what is, the, um, what is the added value of this International Year. So first of all, um, we think that uh, the International Year can be crucial for the recognition and promotion of indigenous languages. Secondly, it's very crucial for, for the empowerment of the communities, building capacities of the communities, uh, and briefing uh, some more inspiration to indigenous communities. Because in some cases, we see a lot of pessimism, global pessimism uh, towards the languages and the parents, indigenous parents themselves are very pragmatic now. In my republic, for example, they, they, they see that there is no need for indigenous languages to be taught to their kids because uh, it's not, uh, for, the, for their future, it's not so necessary to, to know these languages. And this is the, uh, the paradox because uh, the kids themselves, they pretty much want to learn those languages and they seek uh, access for opportunities, different courses and uh, education in school. And this is, um, this is something which should be elaborated on during this year. Also to mobilize indigenous communities uh, and to mobilize attention, international attention, domestic attention. And of course, um, expanding language policies and negotiating new, more effective language safeguarding strategies, which seem to be untimely or unnecessary before. Um, this international year could also serve 
uh, for raising more resources uh, and uh, practical um, preservation and revitalization work. Uh, it, it's also crucial to support and acknowledge language grassroots level activists and collect disaggregated data because sometimes we don't even know where indigenous languages are spoken, how big communities are, and so on. Uh, I skip some, some of the slides because really my, my time is, is over. So I, I just want to focus on uh, one example. Uh, we in Karelia decided that we should not seek big uh, achievements because it's not realistic. We decided to uh, adopt a small win strategy uh, which means that we support uh, small scale initiatives, gra grassroots level initiatives of indigenous communities, indigenous language activists, individual activists or groups of activists. And uh, we found some money um, from international sources to support these kind of ideas. For example, one of them is um, uh, to develop uh, uh, and to preserve traditional place names, which is very important to have these traditional place names in, 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 in the communities. And another project is focusing on uh, uh, designing uh, uh, office production uh, to support indigenous uh, Karelian uh, alphabet script and promote uh, these ideas uh, to a larger groups of society. Uh, and finally, and not finally, but uh, I mean, one of the final slides, <laughs> uh, because this is a scientific conference, I would like to, to, to mention that um, UNESCO uh, has a so-called call for papers um, for researchers. Uh, and I think this is something many of researchers in, in the US and North America could be interested in. Um, so these papers are very important for the designing of uh, uh, and developing of, uh, of the world uh, report on indigenous languages. So the UNESCO is, is going to come up with a uh, report um, uh, by the end of the year. Uh, and of course, this indigenous scientific and scientific work and papers could be of a great uh, help uh, for, this, for this global report. Uh, but the beginning, at the beginning of this uh, conversation about the international year, uh, Many indigenous communities had a lot of concerns about the fact that uh, many, I mean, a lot of money uh, could go just only to the research. And they thought that uh, researchers are the, the only group who, who would benefit from this year, and the, the actual pr practical work in the communities would be uh, uh, put aside. And um, uh, when we had these conversations, we uh, came to a conclusion that um, uh, there should be a lot of collaboration during this year between researchers, practitioners, linguistic communities, and so on. Um, and um, coming back to the idea that language is a human right, is a human right, um, uh, I, I, I should mention that uh, the Human Rights Council, which is the, the main uh, human rights uh, expert body in the United Nations, has decided uh, to halt an an interactive panel discussion in September on indigenous languages. And this is an evidence that uh, the United Nations system uh, takes this issue very seriously. And uh, uh, hopefully uh, many states would adopt action plans uh, for revitalization and uh, support of indigenous languages. Russia, for example, has adopted this kind of action plan among first, but it is not too late right now for other states to adopt such action plans. Uh, I know the United, the United States has not adopted such a plan, but uh, as I said, it's not too late. Uh, it's still some time to do so um, and uh, engage with indigenous communities to seek their front pride and form consent and elaborate on actions and calls, uh, uh, calls for actions um, together. And finally, um, I'm sorry, this, some of the text is uh, somehow uh, uh, outside the slide, but um, uh, what can we do? Because um, uh, I spoke uh, previously about uh, some possible measures and activities uh, on the global level, uh, regional level, uh, national level, but uh, what about personal level? So on a personal level, people also can do a lot, and there is a so-called uh, Indigenous Language Challenge, uh, 2019, uh, 
And those people who take this challenge up, so they commit to study an indigenous language, uh, they can, you know, uh, suggest an extent to which they learn the language. So of course, it's not probably possible to learn uh, just fully uh, in one year. But uh, I, for example, committed to uh, to study a, a southern dialect of the Karelian language in order for me to be able to uh, make a small presentation by the end of the year in the community uh, uh, in this this language. And many people on Facebook and Twitter, so they take this la this indigenous language challenge and. Uh, I hope many, many of you could also join this, uh, this um, campaign. So thank you very much, and I'm sorry that I uh, exceeded my limits. Uh, so thank you very much. I, I hope that we will have a great conversation today. So our, our speakers don't quite match the time. Osio Nigado Ukahatsi Kwanio Dawado Aniyawia Didel Kwasti Degadeo Haskoi Ahan Siu Boulder Dagilam Staneho Jisquaya Barbara Duncan Oginali Ale Dagodeo Haski Tlaye don't a cohega jigolie a no. Hello, everyone. My name is Clint Carroll. I am a, an assistant professor here at CU Boulder in the Department of Ethnic Studies. I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and um, I teach American Indian Studies. Um, Barbara Duncan could not be here today, so I'm, I have the honor of. Um, reading her paper, so I'll do my best to channel Barbara. She's a friend of mine. Um, she's also my teacher. Um, I'm a student of this program uh, that she and, and John Standing Deer have developed, um, and so it's really an, an honor to, to be asked to read her paper. Uh, I want to read Barbara's intro because uh, although she's not Cherokee, she has deep ties and relationships with the Eastern Band. Um, and she has just um, made amazing strides in learning the language, and you'll hear about her story in a minute. And so it may sound weird uh, for those Cherokee speakers out there, if there are any, that I'm reading her intro, but again, in the spirit of being a medium for Barbara, here we go. Ayaji Squaya da Wadoa Chalakad, Barbara Duncan, Yonegad, Sudalsko Sudali, Iagudeti Ada. Taliani din yotli agi kaha nole jo yani jiganlisi ueti chalaki gaduni jinela nole ueti chalaki jun squan jun squan go doti ye dagilon stane ho e Christian Carpenter gayali heli jeha nole agweji aska ya jan gayali heli jeha oginali gatni awika doga gayali jeha um, to translate, um, I'm Barbara Duncan, uh, as I'm called in English. Uh, for those of you just arriving, I'm actually not Barbara Duncan. Um, <laughs> I'm 66, and I have two children and three grandchildren. I live in the old Cherokee country in Franklin, North Carolina. I work at the Museum of the Cherokee Indian. I'm thankful to Kristen Carpenter for inviting me here, and I'm also thankful to my son John for helping me drive. I'm thankful to my friend and colleague, Bullet Standing Deer. <clears throat> I'm going to read in the first person, so um, please bear with me. I want to talk about a new method for understanding and learning and teaching Cher the Cherokee language that I've worked on with John Standing Deer, a member of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. He's going to talk to you in a few minutes. He and I work within the community of the Eastern Band. He is on a survey and crew, and I work at the Museum of the Cherokee Indian, a nonprofit organization. Outside of our jobs, we have worked for the past 12 years uh, without pay on the Cherokee language. 
As a result, with our colleague Susan Ryman Snyder, we have created a new method for understanding Cher the Cherokee language, as well as a website, a dictionary with more than 80,000 words, uh, a patent, and a sequence of four courses with textbooks that I have been teaching at the University of North Carolina in Asheville during the evenings. Uh, our courses have included a pilot project with members of the Eastern Band meeting in the evenings uh, for six years, for the past six years, a small class that met in Cherokee for three days and continued via Skype with members of the Cherokee Nation, and I was a part of that uh, kind of guinea pig um, run there at the beginning. I was uh, really honored to be a part of it. Um, online and Skype classes, undergraduates at, or undergraduate classes at the University of North Carolina, uh, Asheville, um, and adult leadership classes for members of the Eastern Band. I had tried to learn Cherokee for 20 years. I read all the books, listened to the tapes and CDs, and had Cherokee friends who tried to teach me. We sang songs in Cherokee, but I didn't know what I was singing. I learned the colors, numbers, animals, the nouns. I learned to write syllabary, but I still couldn't speak Cherokee. Here's one of the problems. The problem was learning the long words, what some people call the Cherokee verbs. These are like a complete sentence in English. People call this a polysynthetic language, a term coined in the early 1800s by Stephen Duponceau. For example, I am working. I could cram one long word into my memory, but when I asked fluent speakers how to change that word to he or she is working, or I will work, or I worked in the past at one point in time, they couldn't tell me how to do that. They could only give me another long multisyllabic word like du lance dans les huh, he or she is working, do dagi lance dans les huh, I will work, dagi lance dans les huh, qui, I worked at one point in time and I was there and witnessed the action. Likewise, the linguistic scholars could not explain to me how to change the words. Their method for breaking down phonemes and morphemes can work if you study linguistics at the graduate level, but their approach is academic, focused on documentation and analysis of language rather than helping people learn to speak. So in the fall of 2006, Gottney Bullet Standing Deer said to me, if the Cherokee people have spoken this language for 4,000 years, there has to be a pattern, and it has to be simple and easy. The words simple and easy and Cherokee language are not usually found in the same sentence. Cherokee is considered one of the most difficult languages in the world for English speakers to learn. Not only is it a polysynthetic language, it has its own writing system invented uh, by Sequoia in 1821. And Cherokee is an endangered language. Among the 16,000 members of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians who live on a small part of their ancestral homelands in the mountains, mountains of North Carolina, only about 200 grew up speaking the language. They are considered fluent speakers today, but they're all more than 60 years of age. In Oklahoma, where the Cherokee Nation and United Ketua Band live, they say there are several thousand fluent speakers. The intergenerational chain of transmission has been broken, and although all three federally recognized tribes are making efforts, Cherokee is still a difficult language for English speakers to learn. We have solved one part of that problem by finding a way to understand and use the long polysynthetic words that are the heart of the language, the Cherokee verbs as they are called. When students can use these words, they can be begin to converse with native speakers, the ones who grew up speaking the language. When Bullet said there had to be a pattern, we began looking. To make a long story short, we found it. Every one of those long polysynthetic words has an underlying pattern, and the pattern is the same for every word. It's like a math equation. We read dissertations by linguists, um, manuscripts from archives, books about Cherokee culture, and sources from the early 1800s. We talked with fluent speakers. And about after a year, we found that, that the underlying pattern of Cherokee words could be described in a one-page chart. We called this the grandmother chart, because in Cherokee, the word for grandmother means she will pick me up and carry me. And this chart 
carries us to an understanding of the language. What we found is that every long Cherokee word has four essential parts. Who is doing the action? What is happening? How the action is happening? And when it is happening? Prefixes and suffixes provide additional information, including plurals, direction of the action, and so on. Other scholars have looked at similar structures, but didn't find the regular patterns as we have. We did not use terminology from English grammar or from linguistics. We kept our terminology as simple as possible for several reasons. We wanted to make this easy for everyone to use, and we wanted to be accurate with the Cherokee language. Many terms from English grammar and from linguistics are not accurate in describing Cherokee parts of speech. For example, the English terms transitive and intransitive do not apply precisely to Cherokee verbs. There are many exceptions. When we created the grandmother chart, we checked our results with speakers. Because we were using the full forms of the words in order to see the patterns, many of the words came from older sources, and so speakers said, I haven't heard that word since my grandmother used it. So we called this approach, your grandmother's Cherokee. In the who column, you have the 10 active people, which are the same for hundreds of verb roots. Let's see if I can. So the who column here, and these are the English translations or the English equivalents. This is one of the ways we differ from other scholars in that we have discerned the patterns that make these very consistent from word to word. If you learn these 10, you can apply them to hundreds of verb roots. <clears throat> in the what column, you have the one consistent verb root, and it's blank here because this is a chart that's uh, supposed to be applicable to all of the um, Cherokee verbs. Again, we differ from other scholars in that we see the patterns within Cherokee words that make this regular. Other scholars say that each verb has five different roots that must be memorized. We see the Cherokee pattern that makes this consistent for every verb. In the how column, you have a sound that carries from tense to tense but can be predicted based on patterns within the patterns. In the when column, you have only seven possibilities that are used on every verb root. Again, this is based on discerning Cherokee patterns in the words. The parts of the word can be separated so that the parts are extremely regular. We use this format to make a matrix for each verb root. And this is one for uh, B somewhere, A do A. The matrix shows the 12 tenses commonly used by speakers today. Using the same columns, the same patterns as the grandmother chart, we created worksheets that students uh, can use to practice conjugating polysynthetic words. So the matrix is one word out of many that can be conjugated using the grandmother chart. And the student worksheet is based on one tense from the matrix. Students practice making this tense with all 10 people. We give them the breakdown of each verb root so that the patterns are consistent. Students don't have to memorize each long polysynthetic word. And I think that is key. It's, it turns from what I've heard people say as a phraseology into an actual structured, um, um, uh, what I call it, in, in a language that um, displays its inherent indigenous logic. Many linguists break down words seeking the smallest parts with meaning, the morphemes. They follow, as scholars do, previous analyses and try to add their own contribution. Their focus has not necessarily been on seeking indigenous patterns or ethno-linguistic categories. What we have done following the idea of Finding the pattern is to find the simplest pattern, the most consistent pattern, which is in fact there in Cherokee words. So why is this important? Seeing these inherent indigenous patterns in this language has made several things possible. The patterns in Cherokee are so logical and consistent that, wor that words can be programmed to be conjugated using a computer or a program. These logical patterns also make it possible for students to become fluent. They can learn the Cherokee language because they can conjugate the Cherokee verbs, the long polysynthetic words, equal to a sentence in English. Seeing the patterns gives us an appreciation of the structure of the language. In addition, seeing these patterns has enabled us to see similar patterns in other indigenous languages. And finally, by focusing on the patterns inherent in the language itself, we are avoiding a Eurocentric colonized approach. 
we found that the patterns of the words are so logical, consistent, and predictable that the conjugations of Cherokee verbs can be programmed with a computer. Working with Susan Ryman Snyder, her sister, uh, we did this and received a patent for the software. To our knowledge, no other language is consistent and logical enough to be programmed and conjugated in this way. And this is just a, um, I know it's really fine print, but uh, uh, the output for looking at the word go in the first person. So who uh, you see is I. Um, yes, the action is happening in the present. When, and so when you input this in on their website, it, it uh, can do this with many different uh, uh, verbs, these word sentences as they call them. Being able to conjugate the words and create a database is the foundation of our website at yourgrandmotherscherokee.com, which went live in 2013. The website includes a dictionary with more than 80,000 words and their fully conjugated forms and ready to use. It is searchable using an English word or a Cherokee word or phonetics in the Cherokee syllabary. For example, you can look up the word sentence for he, she, or I went somewhere or did not go somewhere. The dictionary is not yet complete, but has complete conjugations for all the people and tenses for more than 150 verb roots out of a possible 800 verb roots. The website also includes a user-friendly form called Make a Word, where you can construct these polysynthetic words by choosing their parts. The website includes online courses at four levels with interactive student worksheets and dialogues on YouTube where students can repeat after fluent speakers. So learning in this way, students are able to conjugate these long polysynthetic words that are equal to a sentence in English. Sometimes these words seem to change very differently on the surface. But it is with this method, students can see the relationship, for example, between agaska, it is raining, and daganani, it will rain. Two words that sound very different at, for, at face value. When students learn one verb root, one tense, they can immediately make 10 word sentences of different people. For example, I am going, you and I are going, you all and I are going, he, she and I are going, they and I are going, you one person are going, you two pe people are going, you all are going, he, she or it is going, and they are going. Those are all the, the, um, the tense or the, the persons, if you will. Students also learn the larger patterns that predict how to change verb tenses. So when they learn a new word that ends in ga, for example, they immediately know how to make all 120 forms of the word for the 10 different people in 12 tenses. Because we have analyzed all these words and realize that they conjugate the same, again, that pattern. But it still takes work, obviously. Students still have to practice pronunciation and usually in conversation with fluent speakers. Um, they have to practice speaking. Um, state, the State Department and linguists say that it takes about 4,000 hours to be, become fluent in a language, and so it still takes a lot of work. Um, so I need to skip ahead because I'm out of time. But um, when we initially saw the patterns of Cherokee language, we were amazed. We kept wondering, why has no one seen this? Because it seems so simple and so obvious. We kept wondering, who made this? because it seems so perfectly constructed. Bullet said it was like a flower where every part has its purpose. As we continued looking at resources from, uh, and manuscripts from the early 1800s, we found a quote from Stephen Duponceau, the first head of the American Philosophical Society, and he wrote that the American Indian languages in general are rich in words and, gra and in grammatical forms and that their complicated construction, uh, in their complicated construction, the greatest order, method, and regularity prevail. This seems to describe the patterns we were seeing. He went on to say that these complicated forms, which I call polysynthetic, appear to exist in all those languages from Greenland to Cape Horn, and that these forms appear, dif uh, appear to differ essentially from those of the ancient and modern languages of the Old Hemisphere. In conclusion, indigenous languages are important for many reasons, which others have shared. We have found that they are impor also important because they have a structure that is logical and consistent that has not been noted before. Recognizing this structure recognizes the intellectual achievements of indigenous languages. It also can make them easier to learn and can make it possible for technology to assist in this process. Well, no, thank you.
Shio. Ani, Zani, Awika Doka. I use these words right here now when I'm in introduction. I'm John Standing there. They call me Gani, call me Bullet. My mother is Mary Elizabeth French, full Cherokee. My father, John Standing there, Sr. I am John Standing there, Jr. Um, as I stand here, uh, as I was growing, I grew up just a human being. Uh, when I was in the second grade or so, I used to have to write my name. I did not grow up as a speaker. I didn't hear it much. And so when I went to school, my name's John Calvin Standing there, Jr. I'd write my name on this across my paper. My name was long, so it came across the top and went down the side. And I don't know why one day, as we grow, our mind changes. We see and understand different things. But I realized, I said, uh, we were talking, I see my name, and I don't know what happened. Lightning struck, thunder, I don't know. But I went home that day, got off the school bus and run into the house. I said, Mom, Mom, Mom. She said, what is it, son? I said, Mom, I'm an Indian. <laughs> she said, yes, son, you are. I said, I mean, I like three stooges in the morning, you know? And I would go hunting with my uncles, go fishing with my uncles, you know, had a garden every year, go up in the woods and gather plants, things that I just thought was what we did, the normal, what some people would call traditional, but it was just life. And I said, uh, Mom, I said, uh, my name is Standing Deer. She said, yes, son, it is. I said, Mom, it's a good name, huh? She said, yes, son, it's a good name. I guess that day I became Indian. <laughs> now, as I grew, as I grew and got older, grown, went to school, um, I didn't hear the language much, as I say. Of course, everybody had come through it. My uncles are all in the military. I had 13 uncles. They all went to the military. I started letting my hair grow when I was 18. Now, we got these, we're talking about these indigenous rights, but we also had to talk about awareness and change and understanding in our perception. Um, the Cherokees are called one of the five civilized tribes, meaning we adapted very rapidly. Um, so when I started letting my hair grow out, my uncles teased me because they'd been to the military. They all had a GI cut, and they would call me girl or sissy. Very Cherokee way of uh, not saying you're wrong, but trying to guide me in a different way. And uh, for whatever reason, I seen uh, my hair as part of my Indianness, And that's why I wanted it. I never told them that. And uh, I would never disrespect my uncles. I was always told to respect the elders. But life goes on, continues going on. I did not really have an interest in the language because I did not hear it spoken. Um, and someone even asked me, they said, why does it not matter to you? And I said, nobody's speaking it. Who would I talk to? But in my life, I've always been, again, goes back to that name. Um, we would go when we have ceremonies, dances. I started doing my Cherokee dances when I was nine years old. Uh, I would hear and understand. Sometimes the older men would use the language at that time. And of course, I, someone would tell me, this is what's going on, this is what they're saying this. And after, when you grow up in it, you just know what's happening. And so um, I belong with the group that we go and we represent our tribe. And I got chosen and picked as one. Uh, as a uh, cultural ambassador, because of dancing all year, all my life. Uh, I was taught by a man named Richard Crow, and I knew him as a, a traditionalist, um, spoke the language. Sometimes he would say to us when we were young, he'd say, boys, skistela, skistela. He was saying, help me, help me. And so you would hear bits and pieces. So, so I, got to come, I got to know some of the words. Uh, Kena, come here. Uh, Hadi. They said that means don't or stop. Um, but still, I, nothing, it didn't hit me. And then there began to be talk about the language. And what I realized is that uh, 
we had classes uh, in the Cherokee language since 1970. And still the language kept dying, kept eroding. And uh, again, I wasn't, I thought, well, nobody's speaking it. And so we got, when I got into this group, because I was dancing, because I was, they, were, they said, you know the history? We, we, will you do this? Will you represent us? I said, yes, anything for the people. So that's how I got introduced and came into this group. And we began to talk about the language. And we said, we need to know more about this. All of us are young, all of us were under 60. And the cutoff line was about 55 at that time uh, of uh, speakers, uh, fluent speakers. And so we got into that and we all took a class and uh, I didn't like that class. I, I didn't understand it. It did not help me, it did not give me anything. Uh, I happened, I got lucky. I worked with two men who were fluent speakers. Um, one man's name was Richard Smoker. Another man's name was uh, Wiggins Black Fox. Very old traditional name. We got to talking and uh, we were talking about the language. And um, as I was looking, I talked to Wiggins and we were in closer in age. And I said, there's something wrong. I said, too many people have spoke this language for so long. I said, how can it be so difficult now? I said, no. I said, we've had, the linguists have been here, we've had the books, we've had the speakers teaching. They will give you the word, they say it means this, but it wasn't like the English. They couldn't tell you the ED, the ING. They couldn't tell you any of that, just say this big long word. So I said, well, this is really difficult. So I did this 10-day um, immersion, and I, as I said, I didn't like it. And so I sat still, and uh, I started thinking about the language. I did not really mean and in, intend to get into this as deep as I did, um, but I wanted to understand. Uh, I was looking at the syllabary chart, and I realized something as I was looking at it, which I'd been looking at it for a year. <laughs> because I dropped everything. After taking that immersion class, I just threw it all away. And uh, that difficult and hard, yeah, it was big, paramount. It was bigger than any mountain we have at home. Bigger than these mountains out here. These are big mountains. And so what I did was sit there and I began to realize something. Now, I didn't, hadn't read the dissertations or the books, so I didn't know. And what I realized was that uh, in that syllabary chart that we use, that uh, there were a representation of vowels representation of consonant and vowel, but no representation of uh, consonants alone. So, and I knew that it was really hard to read the syllabary. It, uh, it takes a lot of study and it's hard work. There's 85 symbols. And then what I realized as I was looking at this, I thought, hmm, if I take this symbol for uh, da and make it represent the D sound, and combine it with a symbol that's for the ah sound, I got da. Suddenly I had an alphabet, a complete full alphabet, which where a lot of people, most people had not learned the syllabary, you as a, someone want to learn, you could learn to write like this with this alphabet in one day. I thought, oh cool. I didn't know I'd done something very sacrilegious. I'd went against the great Sequoia. <laughs> I didn't realize that. I just thought I was looking for a better way to help me and anybody else understand and learn. So my people didn't look too favorably on that. <laughs> no. And so, but I stopped. It was, it didn't, I didn't stop. I did not, I, just, I, I seen the reception that was coming, so I just left it alone. But I continued on. And when I did this, when I did this, there was one person, and Barbara and I were not friends at this time. I'd met her because she'd worked with the museum, the Museum of the Cherokee. So because she was an academic, she has a PhD, I went to visit her. I said, uh, Miss Barbara Duncan, I want to show you something. Do you understand this? And she looked at it, and I didn't even explain it to her. I just let her look at it. And she said, oh, yes, I understand this. I understand what it can do. So that was the beginning. And what I said was, um, we, got to, we ran into a problem. We got, we started putting things together, and uh, 
we could see a, a pattern. Um, he had upon here a word, um, I will give you the word, it's gaga, I am going. I actually believe it's gaga, but in time, as time passes, all of us with our, our own language, we really do not know if there was changed or if there's a difference, but we can only go by what we have been taught and what we hear. So that's what we follow. This is what we heard. This is how grandma said it. This is how grandpa said it. This is how my mom and dad pronounce it. So we follow that. So we do not know when a word begins to erode and get shorter. And if you start to speak it and you become, they'll say, I guess, you get real comfortable with each other. You don't have to say a word in, a, in a, its completeness. So this gay ga, which I think is gay ga e, I'll just use gay ga so you can hear it. You got gay ga, I am going. And if I'm speaking to you, hey ga, I'm saying you are going. And if I'm saying someone just left, I'm saying hey ga, she's going. Now, so you've heard a G, an H, and a nothing, right? Okay. So in writing in the syllabary, because there's, there's no, no, no single sound seen, you got the consonants. You could not see the change. So that tell me something. I am a lancer bear. Um, and working out there in the woods, I get to be an Indian. It's cool. My dad used to say to me, he said, think about being a server. He said, he was speaking of himself. He said, who would want to pay a little Indian boy to run around and play in the woods? Because he's a lancer bear. He loved being in the woods. But it showed me something. When I look at a tree, all of you know, got a tree, uh, we look at a poplar tree. We look at a pine tree, we got these words. But if you look at those trees, a poplar tree, you look at its leaf, and you look at its bark, and you look at its shape. All of that tells you, and each one of it has that pattern continuously over and over and over. And that's when I begin to look at the language that way. So I thought, now, for it to have been here so long, for it to be here with this Indian mind, there had to be something. So once you begin to line those words up, those patterns, they just appear. I didn't have to do it, and I don't have to check with anybody because I'm checking with the word. And as the word showed, what I, I told Barbara, I said, what's going to happen is this, is the language is going to speak to us. The language itself will tell us if we just pay attention to the language. That's what we begin to do. And so, as time went on, we begin to see it, and it's like, um, we begin to understand, this is how it works, this is why it's doing it. And in the check-in, because of the conjugation, uh, some, sometimes we have a, there's no true, di well, there is now. <laughs> there was not a true dictionary. It was just a glossary, a, a list of words. So, what we were able to do, Barbara didn't realize it one day, and Barbara, uh, like she said, she'd been trying for 20 years to, to learn. So Barbara learned the pattern wonderfully. And one day she said, well, I have this word, but I, I, it's the wrong word, it's the wrong form. I can't conjugate it. And I said, Barbara, come on. I said, you've been doing this. You know the conjugations. It's there. You know, you know the pattern. She said, yes. I said, what step are you on? She said, the third one, fourth one. I said, go backwards. Don't go down the steps, go up the steps. There it was. Beautiful. Now, um, for all of us of Native people, we say these words and our language means so much and gives meaning to our life, of who we are, what we are. There's been so much change. Um, I don't really think people understand what this word language means. We use it freely. Um, any of you here, if, you're, if you don't, native language is not your first language, we'll say everybody here just went to school learning English. On the day you went to school, you were fluent in English, but you did not understand it. You could not explain it. You had to become educated in it before you could take that word and say, this is what it means. And I, mean, I ask many people, I will say, Tell me what this word means in this, your language, meaning English. And they'll say, what word? They'll say, I'll say water, water. And they'll tell me, they said, um, something you drank. 
ah, life, liquid. And I said, <laughs> I said, does your word water mean that? And they think about it for a moment. They say, well, no, it doesn't mean that. And then someone will get very, they become very good, and they will tell me, water is H2O. I said, do you know that? Yeah, I know that. And I said, have you seen a molecule of oxygen? Have you seen one of hydrogen? They said, no. I said, so what are you telling me then? How do you know what this is? And they begin to think, all right, what I have learned then is I have learned a term for an object. And really, it's a reference point. And so what I've seen with Barbara in looking at this language, when you teach it in the way it's being taught by most people, there's no reference points. You have nothing to build upon. You have nothing to learn. However, when we went to school for English, we were, were given that. And it's pretty, it, that's why we're all speaking now. That's why you guys understand me. I may not be spe uh, speaking the correct English language. I'm sorry. But I only went so far. <laughs> but. What I'm saying is that nobody pays attention. Nobody thinks about it. If you say, I'm happy, I'm walking, even the word happy. I can say I'm happy, and you, if you tell me you're happy, I don't know how much happy you are. If you say you're sad, I don't know how sad you are. It doesn't tell you that. Now, but if you follow these patterns, and as Duponso said, from the top of the world to the bottom of the world, in this new world, they call it the new world, um, we have been here for a long, long time. There's something else you're going to find if any of you choose to follow and go that far. Um, our language is old, very, very old. So of course, it's not going to fit today's language. Um, how much time do I have? <laughs> Sorry. But, but um, it's your fault. <laughs> But what I'm saying is this, we, there's an understanding here that we're, nobody's thinking about. Um, I read a book. I just, I'll, I'll get over it, but I want to tell you this. I read a book. And the book was the title, I think it was The Rule of Four. And it was about a man uh, whose father had been trying to solve a riddle from somewhere in 15 or 1600s. He could not solve the riddle. And uh, so his, his son had picked it up. He was, he, he'd seen it, his father work and work and work in the childhood, kept on working, working, got older, he passed away, died. And the son kept, he picked it up and he kept going. And so this is what the son, he did solve the problem. The son solved the problem, but this is how he did it. What he did was he realized you cannot open a 6800 lock with a 21st century key. It will not work. So that's why that it kind of explains with me, without me saying it, how we came to the grandmother chart. I followed the words. As a land surveyor, I'm a tracker. I followed it. What it was is what it was. I don't argue with anybody. I can't. I, there's no need to. If you want to see it, you follow the tracks too. And whatever it is, it is. Um, I'll give you a little quick hint of something. All of you, as native people, have all of you native people have a word for water. And I might ask you, what does it mean? And you might say it means water, right? OK. In Cherokee, the word we use for I come from is ama, which is very, very strange because before 1800, we didn't have an M in our language. However, the missionaries couldn't explain why we existed. And they asked the elders, they said, who is the smartest, oldest man that you know of, the wisest man? And they said, hmm, 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 they thought about it. Because of no written language, you know, you go back memory and stories, which is why stories are wonderful. And so they said, oh, OK, OK. His name was Wasi. Why well, see? And they said, no, 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 we're missionaries now. That they didn't have that UN directive. You're wrong. His name was Mosey, Moses. 
So we have the M in our language now, but it's only about five words, only about five words. So now let's say, and I have seen documentation, I found papers, and it, that's, why, that's why I went to the oldest sources. I thought that the language would be the most pure of that time. It's just a word, so that's why I went backwards. So here you go, this word is Awa, originally. Okay, now I'm gonna pretend that I know what these sounds mean. And that, mounds, that, that word says, being unseen. Can you see the water? No, you see through the water. That's the original meaning in the Cherokee language. I thank you very much. I thank Kristen for inviting me. And later on, we, we're going to have another session. I think we, we can talk if you wish to talk. Look back at your own language in your own way. Thank you very much. We have um, about eight minutes um, for questions, if anyone wants to ask any. Right back here. Very, um, intrigued about my excuse me I'll start over my name is Ed Ironcloud and I'm from Porcupine South Dakota and uh, my Lakota name is Amahpia Maza which is the same as my last name and I came here with my wife partner she was invited and I came today but I wanted to say briefly uh, about water you know water is very powerful and I could really relate to what the gentleman was saying, my relative there, and in Lakota, water is money, and ma is to say, is short, sh briefly, ma would be me, and ni would be like what everybody would call sweat lodge, inipi. Ini is to live, so you put those words together, it's like, I want to live you know, which is very powerful. And I've always really been um, more, really, as I get older, losing my hair, I really try to, what you were talking about is put words together. What do those words mean? How did they come to be? How did they come to be? And it's really um, descriptive. But I just wanted to share that with you, you know, that much because, um, you know, it's really powerful, and um, you going into the woods, you know, is really, that's the classroom. You know, it's always been, and it's, it's uh, really in, in um, to me, you know, I go out in the woods myself. But in closing, you know, I just wanted to say that, you know, what comes to mind for me, and I don't know the word for Lakota word for it, to me it would be a celebration of life. Because celebration of life to me is very powerful and it encompasses everything and everybody. And I look across this crowd here, this, this, this group of people here, and I always do that when I go into a group. And what I see, I see older people, I see men, I see women, I see younger people. And to me, that's very good. It feels good because as, as a people, that's how we were. We learned from each other. We had the old. We didn't, we didn't really push everybody apart like Western way of, of doing things is really saying, oh, well, these are men, these are women, these are old, these are young. Everything was together. But I'm going to give this mic back because I can talk all day. But... <laughs> And I really want to, you know, thank you for, for listening. And I just happened to fall on this, 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 this event here. And it's very powerful to me because it really gives me the strength. And, you know, I want to go back. I want to learn more. My language, you know, the, the language is very deep, you know, and it's really, it's, it's really powerful. And I see it's, it's the way for us to, 
to um, move back to where we are. And when I say language, you know, real quick, I want to share a quick story with you guys here. Um, I've been watching animal communicators. If any of you have ever seen that, it's where people talk to animals like, you know, they, they look at an animal, a horse, a cow, a whale, and they talk, and they, they tell people what that means. So I was, I was watching that, and then I was telling my son was coming up here, and I was telling him that I was watching it. I was watching it, and um, there was a uh, uh, story about how this lady who would open up this store, and her little cat would walk out the door, front door, which is a busy street, and she was scared that it was going to get hurt, so she calls in this animal communi communicator, so the, the, basically the communicator puts in the little kitten's mind what could happen if she goes out there, you know, and sure enough, it worked. The cat was um, walked to the door and just stood at the door and didn't go any further, and my son was telling me, he said, that was interest, coincidence, interesting because he said that the cat at the house there, he was thinking of, he was going to take a trip, so he's going to put the cat outside because it was a cat he just found, kind of a street cat, but he brought in, took care of it. But he was going to put it outside because he had to leave. And here he looked and the kittens were gone. The kittens were gone, so he looked all over and he finally found them. The mother had, 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 had um, hidden them away. So that just kind of really reinforced me that um, I was thinking that cat knew that what he was thinking of doing, and that's what that's why she did what she did. So um, to tell you the truth, I don't know where I'm going with this, but <laughs> but you know it's just a part of language. You know the language of of many languages of humans and animals, the language that each of us speaks, and the language of everything you know that is around us. You know. That's the language that really, you know, really makes me um, interesting because when I make my journey, when I walk, I don't know who I'm going to, I don't know who I'm going to meet. I don't know who I'm going to talk to, you know. I don't know what situation I'm going to come across. That's a language in itself, you know, and I didn't even plan on being here. <laughs> I was planning on being back home in South Dakota today, but uh, I'm here taking up your time. <laughs> so with that, I just want to say thank you very much. Last question here. We have one minute. <laughs> Um, based on your um, professional opinions uh, and experience, what do you think can be done uh, to prevent this pragmatic reasonings from stopping uh, children learning indigenous languages? Uh, yep, thank you for the question. Uh, actually, uh, so what we are trying to do in Karelia right now is to uh, restore uh, a passion to speak uh, language, Karelian language, and it's it's not easy uh, because okay. uh, already one generation is lost uh, in terms of the language uh, speaking and, and so on. But um, uh, s s researchers say that um, the language is vital if it's spoken in uh, three areas: it's education, media, and and also uh, governance. But also internet, I think it's it's the fourth one. So we're trying to um, to make sure that this Karelian language is spoken in, in these four areas. And since the parents uh, see it uh, somehow, so they, they start little by little understand that the language is, is not just the home language, but it is spoken somewhere. And uh, when it's spoken, for example, by politicians in the political sphere, is the more powerful, the most powerful for them to, to, to somehow restore this uh, uh, fashion and mode to speak the language and uh, also in given the small communities I, I mentioned one example this uh, the language house so this is something which really uh, very powerfully uh, inspired local community to to speak not only in the house but also in the whole village so this kind of little project can do 
the difference. Thank you. Um, for the longest time, the reason that when among my people, economically, it was at a disadvantage for you to learn your language. At the same time, too, there was a, a strong spiritual um, limitation because uh, the Yonega, his, his religion, if you spoke the language, you could go over into your own spirituality. They did not want you doing that. So they spoke against the ceremonies. They spoke both against the dances. And as I said to you, when my uncles would tease me about my hair, they had a different mindset and a different understanding. So what has to happen, if it can happen, we're a long way from, we're a long way from 1900. And that's when the boarding schools were started really heavy. And we became a different kind of people. Um, but there was one thing that really mattered, and it, it is the law, in a sense. There's only one great law with all Native people. We can say we want to live within our traditions, and we can say we want to keep on the language and dance and whatever. Uh, but with what our limitations were, they did the best that they could, and the best that you could is teach them how to live. So if they had to lose the language so that they could get a good job, I remember back in 1970, if you could not um, write a correct sentence or know how to punctuate, you didn't get a good job. If you couldn't speak correctly, you didn't get a good job. So that's why it began to drift away. Now, for my people, other people, it might have been a little longer because according to where they were geographically and how much the community had been, they'd been encroached upon. And so all, this had, all of us have been affected by this. Now, but today, this is America. Everybody, I think, every Indian here has every right and freedom to go and sit with the elder and listen to the stories, listen to the words. We can do that. There's one thing, though. Uh, the one thing you can't do, nobody can do this. We can only hope to inspire. But the great law that we all live by is the I want law. If there's not a payoff to us worthy enough of the effort, we will not do it. And it doesn't matter who you are or what you are or what you do. That is the great law. And what will have to be, we have, as Native people, I, what I've seen is that we're very proud to say what tribe we are. I can jump up and down and scream from my mountaintop, oh yeah, I'm proud, I'm Cherokee. Another person, I'm proud, I'm Sioux, I'm proud, I'm Choctaw, I'm proud, whatever. We can all say that. Oh yeah, I play stickball. You know, I still do that, I still, I eat so chan. And I'm really proud of this. But until they have that same pride of saying, I speak my language, then it will not go there. That's from us. Nobody can make us. That, and, and somehow or another, what has to be instilled in everybody is to have that pride that you want to speak this language. But remember, it is the great I want law. And we all do live by it. And then that will go back to, as each child comes along, they're individuals. If I, I have a daughter. She doesn't think I exactly follow my, my thoughts or belief or wonderment. She lives according to how she wants to. And I must respect that. And that's the real reality for all of us. We can hope that we can give our, 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 our babies, the next one, grandchildren. Do not let it go. Do not let it die. There might be things in there yet. I think there are. That it once mattered to us so much, and it did have power. Our songs, our dances, our language used to have power. And, but then we believed in it. I don't know how it's going to make, how we need to get back to that belief. But that's so, that's going to be very individual, your question on that. Conversation, and I um, will announce the instructions for the workshops. And I wanted to reflect a little bit on the feeling that this um, panel gives me, which is yesterday we spent the whole day really talking about the language of the law, and we were you know, deeply uh, engaged in that discourse. And I think it's really nice, as we're moving towards the panels, to be um, 
in the spirit of indigenous worldviews and thinking um, about issues inspired by um, these languages and um, in, that, in that spirit. And I appreciate very much um, the comments of the gentleman in the back who mentioned that he was you know, ready to go home and, and do something. And I hope that that's um, what, one of the things that we're, we're all taking from this event. Along those lines, um, we will take a, a short break and then um, adjourn to our um, different workshops. And the idea for the workshops is to take some of this conversation that we had yesterday about implementing the declaration and really make somewhat of a plan for action. Now, the plan for action, um, and of course each workshop has a, a moderator who has thought about facilitating the conversation, the plan for action may well build on things that people are already working on together. Um, it may well be short term, medium term, long term. It could be a legal strategy. It could be something that really is um, more about community or education or media. Um, perhaps all of those things because we've talked about this being um, not just a legal movement but a, a social movement um, in many ways toward indigenous people's human rights in the U.S. and of course um, in solidarity with our um, colleagues and brothers and sisters around the world. So with that, um, I will um, just announce which rooms that we'll be in. The technology and media um, workshop will be in room 304. The climate change and environmental advocacy workshop will be in room 305. Cultural rights in room 307, so those are all upstairs. Um, Indian child welfare in 306. Business and human rights in 480. And we added a workshop on language rights um, that will be here. So if you'd like to continue this conversation with this amazing group of panelists, um, please do stay here. There are also signs in the hallway if you didn't catch my, my quick um, mention. And then finally, we'll reconvene in the Shadden Commons where we had lunch yesterday. Um, each moderator slash reporter will share just a few um, points that came out of the workshop um, so that we can all inspire each other and commit to these plans and then we will truly finish. So thank you all and thank you again to the panel. <laughs>